Well, hello, Claxton leaders, fourth and fifth graders. I hope you're having a good day. We're going to have a week of video lessons together, and we're going to kick things off with my friend Stephen Turner from Giving Tree Music. Fifth graders, you've gotten to know him pretty well over the last few days, building your drums and playing with them. And fourth graders, you've probably seen him around our building or at our showcase with the fifth grade so I want to give us a chance to get to know him a little better and then he might lead us in some rhythms. He'll teach us a little bit about the drums that he builds and plays and help us learn a little bit about what it's like to be a musician, an artist, making a living in this world. So thank you, Stephen, for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. This has been a great, great couple days I've been with the fifth graders. It's been We'd awesome. love to see your work here at Claxton and I think we're in our... Help me remember, third or, no. This is our fourth full year. I think we dabbled with it five years ago. That's right. We did the after school thing. So Steven's been coming to our school for probably six or seven years yes. doing drum circles. And about four years ago, we started building drums with the fifth graders. So that has become a Claxton tradition and fourth graders, something you can look forward to next year and um, something that we've just wrapped up with our fifth grade this year. Building your own drum, mm -hmm. customizing your own drum. Steven here builds the bodies and you do the rest. So let's start with that, Steven. How did you get into building drums and then how'd you get into building drums with other people? Got it. Um, <clears throat> well, I started playing drums when I was about four years old. Um, and I was inspired by somebody that the kids may have uh, heard of and it's a true story, which is Animal from the Muppets. Definitely one of the reasons I started playing. So I started playing drums. I drummed on everything I could find from pots and pans and countertops and school desks and my dog and anything I could, could find that could make noise, I started drumming on it. My dad finally got me a drum set. I started playing drums and then I started, I went to my first drum circle when I was about 16 years old, 17 years old, it was at a festival. And uh, I loved it. It made perfect sense to my hands. I could do all the drum set rhythms I had in my head. And so I started going to drum circle after drum circle. Um, I really fell in love with playing different, I, the first uh, hand drum I had was the djembe. Fell in love with playing them. Me and a very close friend of mine that lives up here in Asheville, Danny, who you know, uh, decided we were gonna learn how to make drums together. And so we met a friend, we messed around, we made a whole bunch of really ugly drums and then finally we started making some drums that weren't so ugly. Um, I took those drums, I went on the road, I started selling them at festivals, and have, in order to sell those drums, I would put a whole bunch of them out with people so they would play them. And then that became kind of how I got into doing the drum circles. Started doing drum circles more for a living. Still love making drums and the feeling of creating a musical instrument that I can then go and make music with other people with. It's like full circle art. And I wanted to share that experience with kids or with people. And so we kind of crafted a way to take a simpler, smaller, easier way to create one of these um, West African inspired ashikos and bring them to the kids like you see. And then they sand them, they paint them, they customize them, they tie dye a real goatskin head. We attach them using traditional methods. And at the end of the uh, experience, we get to have an awesome drum circle together. So yes. it's just been a really, really amazing journey. and. Every day I say thank you because this is my life and I get to say thank you for even the opportunity to say for saying thank you. So. And Stephen, I know you uh, play in a band as well. I do. Is that right? A Celtic music band? A Celtic band called Lucid Druid. My, uh, we play with a bagpiper, a stand up bass player, a guitar player, a drum set player, and I play Jim Bay primarily in that band. Awesome. So, Lucid Druid, fourth graders and fifth graders, last year we learned a little bit about Celtic music mm -hmm. and Celtic culture. Um, how'd you get into Celtic music making? Um, well, when I was traveling around with the festivals, uh, the main festival that I would tour with are what's called a Renaissance Festival. And so I would do different Renaissance festivals all across the country, and I would sell my drums at these festivals. That's where I would put them out for the drum circles. Well, at Renaissance festivals, if any of you kids have ever been, there's usually somebody, there's a couple bagpipers wandering around. Well, I've got loud drums and they've got loud bagpipes. Next thing I know, they're coming up and they're jamming with me. So I started getting a feel for those different Celtic um, rhythms, like the jigs and the reels and the, all of that. Um, and so I started playing with them. And then 
when I uh, bought a house in uh, Clearwater, my next door neighbor, um, I went over to knock on his door and say, hey, I play drums, so you know, you hear drums and it's too loud for you, just come knock on my door and tell me to stop and I'll stop. And he said, don't worry, I play bagpipes. And I said, <laughs> awesome. And it turns out that the, uh, my next door neighbor is, was, has won the world champions in, championships in Scotland twice for his bagpipe and his, his uh, composing, and he's an amazing bagpiper. And uh, so we, just because he was right next door, we ended up becoming instant best friends, and we've been making music for almost 20 years now. Wow, great story. It was, it was, really, it was really pretty funny. So how lucky was the bagpiper to have a uh, musician next door who wouldn't complain about I, him? Exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what he, what, he, what he was like, woo, <laughs> it was really funny. So there's a good lesson, kids, to always be a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. Let Absolutely. your neighbors know if you're going to make noise, have a party, Absolutely. any of that stuff. <laughs> That's something some musicians have to learn the hard way. <laughs> so, um, oh, I've, oh, yeah, I've made that mistake before. Too. <laughs> well, um, let's talk a little bit about West African drums. Sure. Um, this is an Ashiko. This is a West African-inspired Ashiko. Yes, it is. That uh, Stephen built himself. Beautiful instrument. Um, tell us a little bit about the um, what you know about Ashiko drums in the West African tradition, and then um, what it took you to build that. Beautiful sure. Drum. The uh, as from my understanding, the Ashiko drum is inspired um, is really kind of inspired from the Congo, which is uh, more of a um, Afro-Cuban style drum, right? And so, which comes from African drums. <laughs> so it went from Africa, Cuba, here. Uh, this type of drum is fairly simple to construct. Um, it started, it was actually the Ashiko itself started in America as, an, as a reproduction of what we could make here of African drums, if that makes any sense. Popularized by um, Desi Arnaz from the Lucille Ball Show and when we hear the Babalu kind of thing, uh, that's when you, when you really first started seeing them. And there, this is a little bit more of a complex build. This is a more traditional a Chico build, if you will. It's done with a technique called coopering, which is a bunch of different pieces of wood put together like a barrel, which is similar to the way that uh, Kunga is built as well, except they're steam, bricks, steam beds. If you look at those, you can see the steam. Um, so I put it together with a technique called coopering. Then we take that piece like this, or this piece was built the same way with pieces, different pieces, it's coopered and I put it on a tool called a lathe. What a lathe does is it makes this piece of wood spin. I spin it at a thousand times a minute. Wow. I know, it's pretty fast. Uh, while it's spinning, I'll take a sharp tool and I'll carve these different shapes and grooves into it. And I always try to describe it as being very similar to a potter making on a wheel. Uh -huh. And when it's spinning, they can shape it with their hands. This is the same thing, except obviously I have to use a sharp tool or I get really bad splinters. So you can't do this with your hand, but <laughs> It spins and I shape it using a sharp tool in the same kind of sort of sense. And then once I've shaped it and created the uh, wooden form, that's what I bring in for the kids. They sand it, they uh, paint it, they tie, they could splatter paint it, they could sponge paint it. We do hand prints. Sometimes the kids are even lucky enough to be able to have time to paint their own, you know, artwork on it, whatever they feel like. And that's what art is, it's expression. And then on the top of it, we stretch goat skin. These are tie-dyed, this one is not, but it could have been. Um, we tie-dye the goat skin. We stretch it over the top. This is a more traditional method. This is a tapped head, meaning that we use a staple gun to attach it. A lot of drums, like your smaller Middle Eastern drums are gonna be more tapped heads. They're glued or they're tapped. Um, this is more traditional. It's done with string. So there's a metal ring down here, metal rings up here, and you run rope between it. All of this is one piece of rope the whole way through. And then he goes around, you pull it really, 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 really tight, you tie this knot in it, it makes it have these kind of sounds. Yeah. A shiko. A shiko. It, uh, the word, as I was taught, means uh, high life or celebration. So this is a drum for having a party. Yes. Sounds like a party. Mm-hmm. So as um, I hope my students will remember from previous lessons in the music room, West African drumming is an important tradition 
that has given music to the world and influenced mm -hmm. music all over the world, especially here in our country, the United States, and uh, it's become a big part of festival life, mm -hmm. like um, Stephen mentioned, where he discovered drum circles and sold his drums. Um, it's part of what we do in a usual school year. We get involved with our local LEAF festival, mm -hmm. and I hope very much that by next school year that will be going on again. Um, usually after Stephen finishes building drums with us, we go out to the LEAF festival and play together. You have a big drum circle out there. Of course, with COVID, we couldn't do that this year. Now, this particular drum we built last year when um, the kids couldn't build drums together. We were all in quarantine doing virtual um, remote learning last spring, spring of 2020. And so we got a group of teachers and parents together to build the drums for last year's fifth graders who are now sixth graders. And we did a stencil design. As you can see, they all ended up with the same paint on the body with their own uniquely tie-dyed heads mm -hmm. that the teachers made for them. But um, we're really happy that this year we can be back at letting our fifth graders express their own creativity with the painting and the tie-dye. And hopefully next year we'll be doing it again. Yeah, hopefully fourth graders, <clears throat> fingers crossed, yeah. will be more back to normal. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the difference between two of the main types of West African drums. Absolutely. This is a djembe mm -hmm. drum. Not one that Stephen here built, but one we've had in the music room here at Claxton for a long time. Um, and there's obvious differences, as you can see in their shape, but maybe Stephen can talk to us a little bit about the difference between a djembe and an ashiko. Sure. Um, the djembe, obviously, it has that goblet shape where it comes in and it comes back out. That alone, just that shape, creates different sounds. A djembe is going to tend to, if you have the same size djembe here like this, and these are about the same size, this will probably, depending on how it's tuned, yeah, have a much lower, you're going to get a lower lower bass note than an ashiko, and you'll generally, this one probably isn't tuned. Well, it's pretty close. Usually you get a lower low and a higher high when they're, when they're tuned right. This kind of floats in that mid-range. Okay. That's mostly because of the uh, the shape of it. it. You get more what's called air compression. Um, the two drums are meant to complement each other. This holds that low and the high, and this kind of sits in the middle. Mm -hmm. In a traditional African West African ensemble, you probably wouldn't actually see too many ashiko. They're there. They they would be more of an ngoma, which is closer to what the conga came from. Uh -huh. uh, but you would have that. It still floats in that same mid range area. And the djembe is for the high end, and then you'd have the big bass drums or the dulimbas for the bass, for the low end. Right. It's usually how it's going to work in a traditional ensemble. But when you go out to the, uh, the, what we have developed in our culture, you know, here, especially in Asheville, you have a great drum circle. In that drum circle community, uh, you'll hear all of these different voices, and the idea is that they complement each other. I think of this drum, uh, the balance between these two is kind of like the yin and the yang. This is very... Female, this is very male, and together they create a wonderful sound. Yeah. They're kind of like partner drums. Absolutely. Right? And this one definitely needs some tuning. It's been here in the music room for many years without having I'll been take care tightened, of that but maybe <laughs> I can do that for you. can tighten it up a little for us. Um, so that's one thing with the rope heads that you can do is retune the drum, mm -hmm. tighten it back up after it gets loose because after many years and a lot of playing absolutely drums will loosen it's up. a natural skin so it's going to stretch and it's going to change with the weather too when it's wet out when it's humid this is natural skin it absorbs the moisture from the air and it gets a little bit looser when it's really cold out or really dry out this will get tighter and tighter and tighter it's not a heat thing it's a it's a humidity thing so it can be really cold in fact usually when it gets really cold that's when these get the most dry right so can you tell us, um, give us a real basic lesson on playing a, sure. a standing drum, like a djembe or an ashiko? What are some basic things we should always remember Absolutely. when we're trying to make music with a so, drum like this? If you guys have a drum around your house, and there's a statistical chance that you do, because this is Asheville. Um, well, now our fifth graders Yeah, and now your fifth do, graders right? have your own. Um, there's a couple things that you should know. One, always play a hand drum with your hands. You don't play a hand drum with a stick. That's very, very important. Now, if it is a stick drum, yes, you can. 
There are exceptions, but make sure someone has told you that that is the exception. Generally, you only play it with your hands. Um, and the sound of a drum comes from the underneath. I think of this kind of like a drum's mouth. And if you have your mouth entirely covered, I know I've got a mask on, but if I were to press my mouth over, my hand over my mouth, then um, you wouldn't be able to hear my voice. Same thing with a drum. See if you can listen. It's sitting flat. If I go, it's kind of dull sounding. But if, exactly. But if I tilt it, I like to put my legs around it like that so you can hold it still. And you get all of a sudden now I can hear the bass end, bass sound. And you got the high end up there so that it's able to open up its voice because the mouth is open. Bottom off the floor by mm -hmm. leaning or holding it up between your legs. And then the other tip I'd like to give you when you hit your drum is that you want to think of it like a hot stove. One of the things that people do exactly, you want to barely touch it. You don't want to go and leave your hand on it because it's almost like when you have it on flat on the ground, it kills the sound. It makes the sound stop. And I'm exaggerating by pulling my hand way up. You don't have to go that far with it. but. the sound, you almost pull the sound out of the drum, rather than push the sound into the drum. So bounce those hands mm -hmm. back quickly. Like basketball, hot stove. You got your low sound in the middle, your high sound on the edge. Now, there are three basic sounds. I'm going to actually see if I can get it out of the djembe, because I think it's a, this is more a traditional djembe sound. There are three basic sounds on a djembe, and they even have words with it. I don't know if you knew this. Um, the bass sound, when it's done with your right hand, is called a goon. Goon. Left, goon. G-U-N. Left hand is doon. Goon. Goon. I like to describe it to my students as an elephant walk. Big, heavy elephant. Goon. 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 Just like that. Goon. Now... There's a second, there's three tones on a drum. This is, or six, if you think of the right level. So you got doon and doon for the bass. The tone is here. Think of it like a big, heavy lion's paw. Drops down. It's about from here forward on your hand. And that's called go and do. Go, do. Goon, doon. So you got those those sounds. Now there's also a sound called a slap. That sounds like this. Now this drum isn't super tight, so I'm not getting. There it is. That's called da and ta. Da ta. Boom boom go go da da. Boom boom go go da da. So that way. It's named if I want to tell you a rhythm and I say goon, go do pop goon, go do pop goon, go do pop goon, go you can go, okay. And we can communicate. Yeah. So um, that would be a really good basic lesson for these. And oh, the 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 slaps are a uh, snake striking. You hit right here, your fingertip your fingers open up and they whip down. If I were to keep my fingers stiff for the slaps. Oops, there's no sound, right? But you once you let those fingers totally relax. As you learn, you usually bruise here, but you're, when you do it, once you get comfortable, it's almost a roll off. So there's not a lot of impact here. And you get that slap. Fingers together. basic tones, and everything else is playing with it. But I like to tell people the only way to make a mistake when you're playing a hand drum is to go to hit the drum and miss. <laughs> that, that's a whole separate set of issues. Right. <laughs> so just like any instrument, or mm -hmm. really any skill, there's entry level. Mm -hmm. Just hit the thing and make some sound and have If it's fun. making you happy, you're doing it perfect. Right, and then there's more advanced ways of approaching it and thinking about it. 
there are people who spend their whole lives getting good at playing an instrument that a lot of people think of as simple, like a drum, but of course, once you're good yeah, at once it. You want, everything can be taken to a different level. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of people who don't. They spend their whole life just enjoying playing a drum and letting it make them smile, and both are valid. Yeah. If you are hitting the drum, if you, you sit down at a piano and you go plank, 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 and it makes you smile inside, I think that is almost as valid as something else. It's when, once you have the desire to practice, that's what drives people to it. Yes. Once you're like, oh, I hear somebody doing something, I want to do that. Oh, to do that, I have to do this. Okay, and then you want to practice or do your scales or do the things that a lot of times people don't want to do until they have a reason to. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. that's the so, way I like to approach music from love. Remember that, students, that music making is about the joy of music making. Mm -hmm. It's not about getting really good. It's not about reading music. It's not about years and years of practice and lessons. Those things can make you an amazing musician, and we all love to watch and listen to mm -hmm. amazing musicians, but we're all musicians, and we can all make music on a basic level, and we should. We should make that a daily part of our lives. Absolutely. I tell you to stay musical, and I hope you will after you leave us and, um, and you'll have something to do that with. Absolutely. If you can remember for always from Claxton and from Steven Turner and giving true music. So, um, and one more thing, um, when we hold a drum, I've noticed you, you keep it leaning outward yes. from your body. I like it like outward. Some people will, I've seen them do this. You're gonna get the same effect if you can hit the drum, but I think what happens is, is it makes your wrist weird. It's yeah. twisted. I like to lean lean it out from my body because that way when I bring my hand down, my arm is nice and straight. Everything is makes sense for your body to move. It's called body mechanics, right? My body wants to do this a lot more than it wants to do this, yeah. right? And this is tiring, whereas this, all you're really doing is lifting your arm. In fact, one of my first drum teachers told me, you don't actually hit a drum. You let your arm fall to the drum and then you lift your hand quickly. Because ah. if you're using effort to go down, that means you have to use effort to stop it. There's good advice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like you, have to, you have to start to slow it down before you get there, and that's mm -hmm. gonna throw your time off. You wanna... It's all, I'm more or less just letting my arms fall to the drum. How about that? But in time. <laughs> just like walking, yep. or when you march in time, you're, that's organized falling. That's all walking is. Drumming is sort of the same. <laughs> Love that. All right. So again, we have an ashiko, a djembe, mm -hmm. and as we'll hear in our lesson tomorrow, Doombe. drummers have been using simple syllable sounds to teach drumming um, since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. We do it here at Claxton with ta's and tt's when we talk about mm -hmm. rhythm. Terra Terra is when we're learning our music notes, but um, the West African tr tradition has those sounds mm -hmm. that Stephen taught us. The, let's see if I remember. Goon, doon, pa, go, up, go, do, do pa, ta. Yes. And that's the bass left and right, mm -hmm. the tone left and right, and the slap left and right. And if you want to know where that came from, and since you're online, you probably can do this if you can watch YouTube. YouTube, Baba Tunde, Ola Tunji. B A B A T U N D E. Baba Tunde, Ola Tunji. O L A T U N J E. Ola Tunji. Baba Tunde, Ola Tunji. He's the one who kind of brought that idea of it here to the United us. States and around the world. One, yep. one of the great African One of the greatest. Drummers. Yes. Stephen, thank you so much of course. for your time. Um, Stephen, always gracious, sharing his time with us here at Claxton, helping us build our drums and teaching us from his amazing, amazing experience. Safe travels back to Florida, Absolutely. my friend. Absolutely. I'm blessed to be here. I can't wait to come back next, next we'll year. We'll look forward to it. Mm -hmm. Peace out. Thanks, you guys.